Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals the Podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by our friends at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is a fantastic organisation. They work very hard to support animal studies academics, artists and advocates in Australia, New Zealand and around the world. I'm a member of ASA. I strongly encourage you to also become a member of ASA. And guess what? You can also follow them for free on Facebook. So today, go to ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association website or Facebook page and join up. Okay, this episode of Knowing Animals is coming to you again from Mexico City and I'm still attending the wonderful Minding Animals Conference. Now, in this episode, I'm very lucky to be speaking to artist, advocate and independent scholar, Carol Gilliard. Gilliard. (laughs) (laughs) Listeners know that I can't pronounce most things, so they'll they'll be unsurprised. It's actually a drinking game, so everyone drink. And today we're going to focus on Carol's book chapter, The Struggle for Compassion and Justice Through Critical Animal Studies, which was published in 2015 as part of the Oxford Handbook of Animal Studies. So welcome to the podcast, Carol. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So Carol, can you start by telling us what inspired you to write this piece? Uh, Well, I have been involved in critical animal studies for about 10 years, um, and I helped to develop the uh, the Institute for uh, Critical Animal Studies, the journal there, actually, I was uh, associate editor with Steve Best. Um, this particular piece, um, I was really glad to do. I had just done a conference that was all about media um, and how media artists have been uh, really influenced by their work on animals. So that was really fun and lovely, and I learned a lot, and I'm sort of back doing that now. But um, Linda Kaloff, who is at University of Michigan, um, was editing this very large animal studies uh, anthology and asked me to do the chapter on critical animal studies, which sounded great. And um, actually, she asked me in 2012, and of course, academic publishing is very slow especially these large handbooks of Oxford's. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I really wanted to give people uh, a feeling for critical animal studies the way I saw it, and this was a chance to do it. So, but I did in, involve, um, you know, the people I've worked with and, and influences that I felt were really important. Um, I highlighted hem- uh, feminism, Feminism, uh, which I, you know, felt was uh, very important to critical animal studies, and as, uh, you know, certainly was for me um, as an early feminist. But um, I also wanted to give them an idea of uh, an example of what uh, critical animal studies looks at. So I chose uh, a narrative of a calf, um, a veal calf, which um, I'd been very uh, bothered with, um, you know, from early on, but especially when I would see veal calves, um, the little houses that they live in in Quebec, um, and you don't usually see those because they're hidden. So I started with that narrative and then worked outwards, uh, sort of in spirals to all the the impact that that uh, industrial agriculture has, and then ended back at the at the calf. Yes, it's certainly very moving the way in which you describe the life cycle or the happen- what's happening to the calf and it, I think your chapter is really beautifully constructed and as you say, you keep coming back to that example. So can you start by telling listeners what critical animal studies is or mm-hmm. means to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, call, I called the, the, the title of the chapter, I felt that it's you know its real goals are justice and compassion 
um, they're linked to um, those goals are linked to um, not just animals but human beings and the earth as well um, so um, I think it's really important when thinking about critical animal studies is that in my mind it's different than animal studies that actually isn't politically involved and isn't socially involved and and doesn't look at the wider impacts of of how animals actually are made to live in this contemporary world um, so it definitely involves social justice in terms of humans but um, uh, you know any kind of of domination then is looked at very critically and and all the little pieces that go into making that so if we take the example of the dairy calf mm -hmm. or the say, field calf yeah. the field calf yeah. sorry um, in Australia we call them bobby calves Have oh you right right you do yes yeah. yes um, and say factory farming more generally in what ways does critical animal studies or CAS give us a unique lens or a different lens through which to think about that issue? Well, one of the things I highlighted, um, first of all, I tried to give international uh, examples. And one of the things I highlighted, of course, is um, the, you know, the kind, well, first of all, the numbers of calves over the world that are killed um, is enormous. And the numbers of animals killed over the world for industrial agriculture is enormous. So what are the impacts of industrial agriculture? And um, uh, certainly I looked at uh, factory farm workers, but I also tried that with the, the um, Olympics were going on at the time in Brazil. And <laughs> um, I mean, I love baseball, but I'm not like a sports geek, you know, in some ways. Um, but I found a book um, by a sports writer, and I'm going to blank on his name. He's a terrific journalist, a sports journalist, and he um, when he you know went to Brazil. It was in the Olympics were in Brazil at the time, and it was so obvious that the kind of um, um, the, the impacts that came from that for workers. I mean, the the fact that. Uh, many uh, people are sort of sent or taken out to the country to deal with farms, uh, you know, the, the meat farms or, you know, animal cattle farms, and really never make it back to their homeland. They're really slaves. Um, and, and that was something not surprising, but it was something I thought I really should include. Um, and that that his research on that I thought was really important, um, especially in terms of, you know, how the the branding of the Olympics and the sort of wonderfulness that we see on TV and as we watch the Olympics and what the underside of that is really quite formidable and um, nefarious. So um, the other thing that. Uh, I really wanted to highlight was um, the Im environmental impacts as well um, and what that does to species extinction, what it does to the kinds of um, climate change that we're seeing now and so I, I talked a lot about that as well. Yes, actually I've got a quote here from the book. So you write, climate change, species extinction and the escalating slaughter and exploitation of animals are the three major crisis points needing to be faced in any discussion concerning human-animal relations. So why those three in particular? Well, I think they're the most pressing. Um, I, I, being alive right now is constantly wondering if one will ever see a future in which um, I mean I'm I'm you know in my 60s right now and I remember going to an island uh, off the coast of South Carolina that was wild and crazy and and now it's just filled with um, uh, resorts um, so the impact of both the population but especially of what we're doing um, in, in terms of climate change and of course lots of people are talking about it there's lots of research we know it's happening 
And then, of course, we have a political system in the United States right now that is, <laughs> it totally denies that this is happening and really doesn't care. Not only, th they just ignore wants it. it. To happen. <laughs> yes, wants it to happen because it makes more money. Um, so we're, we're going to be seeing lots of impacts uh, on, and especially on the poor, the global poor. And, and of course, you know, if one is compassionate and cares about other people and other beings, this is really the most pressing thing. And species extinction, of course, uh, you know, I think is, is monumentally important. About 12 years ago, there were a number of people who were saying that species extinction was actually causing climate change. Now climate change has actually taken over. Um, and so I think that's an enormous problem um, that we really need to face for, for every being on the planet. Or we really won't, we will have ruined the planet both for ourselves and for other, the millions of other species that exist. And we're just one small species. I know we're, there are a lot of us, and we think we're really smart, but we're just one. So, Carol, how do you draw um, the links between animal agriculture and climate change? Well, uh, the, the, the results of a animal agriculture, um, first of all, habitat destruction is enormous. So much um, of forest has been destroyed whether it's uh, forest in Brazil the the uh, you know the the rainforest and um, or other all over the world um, you know forests and habitat for uh, animals has been destroyed so um, that's that's one thing the other thing of course is that the uh, the the water the um, is really being, I mean, water is going to be, as a number of people have said, Vandana Shiva and a number of people, to her early, but other people are saying that now. The We're really ruining the wa our water sources. And, um, you know, we, we tend to think, oh, we'll just get, <laughs> we'll always have water. Water is always something that one, but, but many people around the world have no water and, and really go uh, miles to, to, to find it and bring it back to where they need it. So that's been, and it's also been made toxic by all the runoff from the enormous uh, uh, operations of factory farming. So those two things, even just those two things, but then you look at the kinds of um, emissions, uh, methane uh, particularly, and, it, and when I wrote this, um, you know, a number of uh, people from, uh, well, uh, well, I guess an organization from the UN had lots of information about um, and data that really factory farming, and and they've for some reason this seems to have gone down. But at the time, there was a, a percentage of something like it's 55 percent of global warming is caused by industrial agriculture. Now, for some reason, that's sort of been demoted to 35 percent. But we, I think, we know in in you know that we really could change that if we were vegan, if we were um, really thought very carefully about what we're doing. Which, of course, we don't. I'm saying we in the wider sense of being a member of this particular species, rather than you and I. <laughs> Well, look, there's plenty that I do that I could do much better on. So I'm certainly not beyond criticism. Um, but that brings me to my next question is, what what changes would you like to see? You know, I thought about that question. You gave me that question to, to gave me the questions to look over. And I, I had a very hard time. <laughs> time coming up with one thing and I think that's more about me and my personality well, than anything well, yeah. but <laughs> well Carol don't jump ahead because I'm going to ask you your five quick questions yeah. so should we go to them now yeah oh sure yeah okay so I typically say everyone who comes on the podcast is asked to answer five quick questions are you ready for your five quick questions oh my goodness yes <laughs> <laughs> okay so can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever read yes and this will tell you how old I am. Um, when I was, uh, I had just gotten my MFA and um, at Southern Illinois University in printmaking, 
and uh, I uh, went was in Washington D.C. and I had decided to go there because there were a number of um, animal organizations there. But uh, as I, I I'm also an artist, so I actually did a lot of work. But um, I've always been a, a big reader. Um, the first book or piece of scholarship was a book by. Um, well, the name of it was Animals, Morals, uh, no, Animals, Men, and Morals. And it was a British publication, Rosalind Godalovich, um, and her husband. And um, there were a number of really, really interesting writers. And I was already a uh, vegetarian. All my artwork was about our relationship with animals. It always has been. But that book was just wonderful. Quickly after that, I read a book by Mary Midgley, and then Animal Liberation. So it was actually Animal Liberation was my third, third sort of you know life changing book. But the the Rosalind Godalovich book was really and should be talked about more than it is. It was a fantastic book. Wonderful. So Carol, can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever wrote? <laughs> Again, an interesting question because I was doing so much about animals in my artwork. So I wonder if I can sort of change this up a bit and Please. talk about uh, visual art and the kinds of th things I was doing as an artist. Um, as a printmaker, I did um, a lot in wa when I was living in Arlington, which is right outside Washington, DC, I did a, a, a well, I guess what I would call the first, I don't know about animals, but animal rights. I had done other print series, and I always work in series, but this one was called Tales from the Factory Farm, and it was a series of monologue, uh, monologues, mono, monotypes, um, very colorful and ki very graphic and almost um, cartoony, but um, it, it actually got, you know, lots of attention because it was very different in terms of subject and the way I was handling it. Um, and then I all, after a uh, long series, there were a couple things in between, but I spent about five years working on a, a, a series called uh, Tale, um, the Dante series. And it was basically the Inferno. Um, I re was rereading the Inferno and I sort of used it as a model for um, animal experimentation. And I actually met Tom Reagan through that. He saw it and uh, left it left his card, which was pretty exciting. How and fantastic. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to see your artwork, Carol. Thanks. I don't show it anymore, but I I make it's it has been up on the web, so yeah. 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 I'd love to show it to you. Oh, thank Thanks you. so much. <laughs> So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Um, again, because I, you know, we didn't really call it animal studies until now um, or recently, um, I would have to say, even though I was already, you know, into being vegetarian and animal rights, I have to say that I, I can't say that he wasn't the person who had the most effect on me. I got to be friends with him and, and Nancy, and um, they were such wonderful, special people, very supportive of my work all the way through. And um, and I, as an artist, and then um, when I went back to get a, my doctorate in animation, and then later when I, you know, really was focusing on writing. Um, so yeah, I would say Tom Regan. Well, of course, at the Minding Animals Conference, we have the Tom Regan rem yes. Memorial Lecture. So that must have been very special. It was for very you. special. It was yeah. very special. And I have, I told Nancy I would report back to her. About oh, how, how it wonderful. Went. Yeah. yeah. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Well, that's an interesting question. And I know when, having been an academic for 30 years, um, <laughs> you know, the idea that activism doesn't belong in the, in the ivory tower is is quite wrong I think it absolutely does and if if our work that we're doing as scholars doesn't mean anything then why are we doing it so I think as scholars um, and as and 
also in terms of academia teaching how I mean you have a captive audience <laughs> and um, so I developed an environmental ethics class at Emily Carr and also a critical animal studies course and this was um, early 2000s and loved teaching those two courses and the students were very responsive some became vegans many like you know I, and whether they stayed vegan or not some did some didn't but I felt and they told me that it really made a difference and of course it was it wasn't so much me it was the it was you know this is an idea whose time has come and this was that's why well, Carol, we're, we're now at the final question, which was the one we were right. kind of intimating right. towards earlier. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, hmm. what would it be? Well, that we didn't eat animals. I think that's pretty much the core. You can't really love anything or be respectful of something when you eat it. And I realize they're are many indigenous cultures that don't feel that way and I understand that but I'm speaking from my own experience and that's that's what I think would make the biggest change so Carol what are you working on next I uh, just turned the manuscript in for a book called the creative lives of animals I would say it's not a critical animal studies book but of course I got a lot in there that you know <laughs> it certainly sounds like it, but um, it is not a book about art. It's not a book, um, and I'm not a biologist, but it's being published in science by University of Chicago Press. And I have had, it's very difficult in many ways, but the most fun writing it. I learned so much about the incredible species that we live with and their diversity. And the the whole theme of the book is that individual animals in their creativity um, are completely crucial to biodiversity in those circles and you must spirals and circles seem to repeat themselves for me but in those circles of effect um, uh, because of course animals um, in their creativity um, really oftentimes I've learned are um, uh, in, very instrumental in their own and this is something that a number of scientists are talking about right now. Um, so I got to interview scientists, and all of them were very supportive and very generous with their time and their knowledge. So I'm pretty excited about that coming out, which it won't be, and it won't come out until 2019. Yeah. <laughs> but that's great. Yeah, well, that's okay. It'll be 2019 soon enough. Don't you worry. And so, how can people find out more about your work? Um, I have a, a blog that I'm probably going to be you know starting on again it's sort of a website blog called animal influence um so that's one site i still have a site up um uh, just caroljuliati.net um but i've published quite a bit throughout the years so i have um you know lots of stuff to read um and yeah i'd love it if people would would read my work um just you know, there's a list of my publications on both sites. Um, it's always nice to know that one is not talking to the ether, but <laughs> actually is, is being read, and um, that's that would be great. Mm, absolutely. Well, Carol, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. This was lovely. Animals. Great thank questions. <laughs> and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. Also, don't forget to leave a review. Reviews on YouTube make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.